Good morning. We're going to take our text out of Leviticus 23 once again. We'll be reading from verses 9 through 14 in Leviticus 23. And the word says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf a he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor, and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hen, and ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears unto the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Let's pray. On our behalf, but Lord, I thank you for rising again. Help us, God, to celebrate the resurrection today through this uh, uh, lesson on first fruits. We ask that you be honored and glorified, that Jesus be uplifted, that folks be drawn close to him, and Father, souls be saved. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I remind you again, Passover speaks of our redemption through Jesus Christ. Unleavened bread speaks of our justification and sanctification through Jesus Christ. And now the feast of first fruits is fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This festival was to thank God for the crops, for the harvest of food that gave people life. This was a symbol of Christ's resurrection. He is the first of the harvest to rise from the dead to eternal life. Noting some specifics of this feast this morning, the festival was to begin once they came into the promised land and planted their crops and the harvest began to come in. They were to take a sheaf that is a stalk here and there. As the harvest is just beginning to ripen, they are to go through the field and get a stalk here and there. Bundle it together and bring it to the priest. He was to then take the sheaf and wave it as an offering before the Lord. Lifting it up before the Lord. Saying, thank you God for this promise of harvest. We promise to you God our best. We promise to you God the credit and the praise and the glory. We promise to you, God, all the rest. In other words, God was going to be in charge of all of it. They were offering it to Him. This was to be done on the day following the Sabbath, which would be what? The first day of the week. It's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And so this celebration took place in looking forward to Jesus' resurrection on the first day of the week. There's no uh, coincidence there. It was uh, very specific in the um, foreshadow or the typology there of Jesus' resurrection. After giving the wave offering to the Lord, the priest was to approach God for atonement through a special burnt offering. Note also that a special grain offering was to be offered to the Lord. A grain offering two times larger than the usual. The aroma of the burnt sacrifice and grain offering ascended up symbolizing God's acceptance. He was pleased with the aroma of sacrifice, the obedience of His people. But there was a clear prohibition. The people had to put God first. They were not to eat of the grain or the bread made from the grain until this wave offering had been offered. 
And this was to be a permanent law throughout all the generations of Israel. Of course, we could take an application for today in that we are to give God our best. We are to give God our first, not the leftovers. But that's not really our subject today. The festival of first fruits is a symbol of our Lord's resurrection. Christ is the first of the harvest from the dead. And by that I mean to eternal life, to new life, to glorified life, never to die again. It is Jesus Christ and His resurrection that give the believer hope of arising from the dead to live eternally with God. I'm glad that Jesus came and was born. I'm glad that He lived. But listen, if He had done all that and not died, was buried and rose again, it would have been for naught. But Jesus did die in our place. He was buried and He did rise again, all according to the Scriptures. And because of that, we have hope in Him. The prophetic picture of our salvation is that the Passover symbolized the believer's deliverance or redemption from sin, from the world, and the, uh, and the system. The uh, festival of unleavened bread symbolized the urgency of the believer to leave the world behind and begin to march toward uh, heaven, toward our, our um, heavenly home, being changed. Um, repentant, a new person, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And then the festival of first fruits symbolizes the glorious hope the believer has as he marches toward that home. The hope of being raised from the dead to live eternally with God. All because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 26, 23 says, that Christ should suffer and that He should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, 21, 22, 23. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. The importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ cannot be overstated. It cannot be overstated. Christ's resurrection is not only the heart of the gospel, it is also the foundation for belief, for all of our belief in our own resurrection, as well as everything we preach and believe. In 1 Corinthians 15, as I've already quoted a little bit of that chapter, I want to point out to you the gospel directly from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. In other words, as the Scripture, that's Old Testament Scripture, had prophesied that He would do. And that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to to the Scriptures. I want to focus on these two verses for the gist of our lesson today. The first one says, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 through the end of the chapter says, 
For even here and too were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who is his, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And then in Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. The basis of the message, uh, at least this part of the message, um, is that phrase found in that verse, who gave himself for us. What a powerful statement. Jesus gave himself for us. They didn't overcome him. They didn't, you know, he submitted to the crucifixion. He submitted to Calvary. He allowed them to nail him to that cross. He gave himself for us. Jesus has said in John 15, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what he did. He laid down his life. He said himself, speaking of his life, no man taketh it from me. I lay it down of myself. He went on to say, if I lay it down, I can take it up again. The sinless Son of God lay down his life for us. He gave himself for us. He who knew no sin, he who was without spot, and without blemish. Never one imperfect thing did he in all of his life. He was perfect in every way. Yet he suffered for us. See, he was God's sacrificial lamb. When John saw him coming and he pointed out his followers to look at Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That's exactly who Jesus was. The Lamb of God. The fulfillment of the Passover. The, the, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. His precious blood was shed because He is a sacrificial Lamb. I pointed out that the Bible said that he died according to the Scriptures. Remember, they only had the Old Testament. The New Testament wasn't... <laughs> it's still being written, I mean. But listen to this. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many? For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. 
because he had poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Was it prophesied in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Jesus' death was according to the Scriptures. He died a sinner's death, not because He was a sinner. We've already established that fact. He died a sinner's death because I'm a sinner, because you're a sinner, because all men are sinners. Sin entered the race and death by sin through Adam, our federal head. Jesus Christ became our head of the believing and took that sin and died with it. He paid our price. He died our death. He endured the wrath of God for my sin, for your sin, for all sin. That don't mean that all are saved, but it does mean that all can be saved. It does mean that, that um, placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we can be saved. <sighs> he also is our example. We were told that Jesus set an example for us to follow. Philippians 2, 5 said, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. He that saith he abide in me, him all, himself also so to walk, even as he walked. 1 John 2, 6. Jesus put others above himself, didn't he? He absolutely did. He saw the need of mankind. He saw your need. He saw my need. And he gave his all to take care of that need. Surely, we can give ourselves and our means so that others can hear the gospel. But that's not all of it, is it? Back in, our, in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried. He died and He was buried. Some say, well, He just swooned on the cross. He fainted under the pain and agony. and He didn't really die. You don't bury swooning men. You don't bury fainted men. You bury dead men. He was buried. Because He died. Think of the seeming defeat of that hour. This band of disciples that had left everything. He called fishermen to leave their boats and nets, and they did. He called a tax collector to leave his table of receipts, and he did. He called folks to follow him, and they did. Now they have seen the one that they left everything to follow die upon a cruel cross. The world says it's all over now. Religion, the Jews, the religion... This imposter is gone now. The one that claimed to be God, claimed to be the Son of God, claimed that He was going to raise up a temple in three days. They didn't understand He was talking about His body. but The devil says, I got Him now. The devil had been trying to defeat Him all along. Tried to thwart the birth. Tried to derail the gospel all along. Jesus is dead. In the Gospel of John, chapter 19, and verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, He said, It is finished. And He bowed His head and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because... It was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was nigh at hand. Besought Pilate that their legs, talking about the three crucified there, be broken, and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Another fulfillment of Scripture. That not a bone of him would be broken. Just like not a bone of the Passover lamb was to be broken. Jesus had finished what he came to do. 
When he said it is finished, he released his spirit back to the Father because he was finished. The Lamb of God, the perfect, fulfillment of the Passover Lamb. Blood has been shed for the sin of mankind. The sin debt has been paid in full. It was finished. And it was buried. The same chapter, verse 41. John 19, verse 41. Now in the place where He was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. Why a borrowed tomb? Because he wasn't going to need it long. <laughs> you, know, you know, some people borrow something, you just, you just write it off. I mean, you ain't getting it back unless you go looking for it. Hope you can get it back. Wasn't, it, wasn't the case here. You, you know, in, you remember in the early days of the pandemic, a couple years ago, early days of this pandemic, people made a run on certain things. Remember that? Couldn't get toilet paper. I'm not supposed to say that. I'm supposed to say bathroom tissue. You couldn't get it. Well, Michelle, Michelle and I shop at Sam's, and, and you know, you buy them big old things, like 48 or 64, or whatever, how many is in that big old package? She had just bought one before this, before this happened, and so we had plenty. And, and somebody found out, I'm not going to call names, but somebody found out we had plenty. And they came by one and said, said I can't find any a toilet paper. Can I borrow a roll or two? I said, no, no way. <laughs> I will gladly give you a roll or two of toilet paper, but I don't want it back. You ain't borrowing it. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. Listen, Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb because He wasn't going to need it long. And He wasn't going to do anything to stink it up. Right? He wasn't going to mess it up. He wasn't going to corrupt. His, his, his body was not going to see corruption. Again, according to the Scriptures. You won't leave my, my soul or my body in hell, the grave. Um, it was not going to decay and rot in that sepulcher. It was going to come forth very, very soon. But what I want you to see is that the one who had stood outside the grave of Lazarus and cried, Lazarus, come forth! And he who had been dead four days walked out of that tomb, still bound in grave clothes. Jesus had to tell him, loose him, let him go. This is the one that had died and been buried. There's no way that death could hold him. There's no way that this grave could bind him. He was coming out. Because he is the Son of God. The tomb was sealed. The guards were placed. The tears were cried. But it's Jesus in there. He's coming out. I direct your attention. The last part of that verse said, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I direct your attention to Matthew chapter 28. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and His raiment white as snow. And for fear of Him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for He is risen. As He said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay. Jesus had already, the stone, look, look, the stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. The stone was rolled away to let the women see in. Jesus was already gone. Something happened down at the garden too. A great earthquake. The angel of the Lord showed up. The stones rolled away. And behold, the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. He's alive forevermore. He's alive. He's alive. In John chapter 2, verse 19, 
Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Verse 21, But he spake of the temple of his body. See, he had predicted, just like the Old Testament had predicted, that he would, be, he would die, he would be buried, and that he would rise again. Jesus himself had predicted the same things, and they missed it. Because Jesus lives, all can be saved. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, because Jesus lives, we can be saved. If He had died and been buried and that was the end, we still wouldn't have hope. There have been a lot of imposters come and go. They've died and they were buried and they're still buried. Jesus was no imposter. Jesus was very God. He died, was buried, and rose again. And because he lives. All will be raised. All that believe in Him will be raised to newness of life. All that reject Him will be raised to eternal judgment. But John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, Jesus spoke very clearly when He said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. They'd have done good or obeyed the Gospel or obeyed God or been saved, believed unto the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil or disobeyed or, or lived in rejection or did not believe unto the resurrection of damnation. But all will hear His voice. I want to close with a very, very, very familiar um, words of, of Paul to the Thessalonians. Words of hope, words that we can rest sure upon. When he said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep or have died, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Are these words a source of comfort for you? Amen. Are these words scary? Are these words frightening for you? If you're lost, if you're without Jesus, if you've never received Him as your personal Savior, they ought to be frightening. Because He's going to shout. Those that have believed are going to be raised, be taken out of this world, we're going to meet Him in the air and we're going to be transported to heaven and we're going to be with Him throughout eternity. If you're not in that group, if you're without Christ, if you have rejected Him, you're going to be left behind to endure hell on earth. And then when that's over, hell in hell. And ultimately, hell in a lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20. You don't want that. You don't want any part of that. Jesus paid your price. He was buried according, uh, died according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So that you, me, we can have life and life eternal. Today. I hope these words are a source of encouragement to you. I hope you can glory in the resurrection of your Savior. But listen, if He's not your Savior, today He can be. 
You can place your faith in Him today. You can admit to God, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. You can proclaim your trust in Jesus. Jesus, I see now that you're the one. You're the Savior. You're the only Savior. You're the one that I need to get me to heaven. I can't do it on my own. It's only through you. Just pray a simple prayer. God, forgive me. Cleanse me. Jesus, I trust you. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Savior. Take over my life. If you'll do that, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's stand. Dear Father, we thank You today for a wonderful day in Your house. We thank You, God, for a wonderful word to share. And now I just ask for Your wonderful Spirit to take and apply Your word here in this room and far, far over social media. Share Change lives and hearts. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.